second event, which is the panel discussion number nine. So the topic of this session is NFT and digitalization, how IP right, rights should cover these new technologies. So for this session, we have our moderator, Dr. Doni Haudong, is the partner at Fuja Partner and Alliance Firm of Medwar Woods, China. And the speakers are Barrett Spragans, partner at Kennedy Lenard Spragans, USA. We also have a Begum Ertuk. She's the legal manager at Sabat Holding Turkey. And lastly, we have Mal Malgor Zata Gulsiaka. You can uh, call her as Gosia. She's the partner at Hickman Baker Bingham Ledesma LLP USA. Now, Dori, I'll hand over the session to you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for the introduction. And I actually, uh, because uh, you have uh, already introduced all the speakers and uh, my great uh, colleagues here and the panelists. So I think um, maybe we can just go to the, the meat of our discussion today. And just give me a second. I'm trying to share my, my screens. Okay. So can you guys see all these kind of slides? Yes. Yes. Oh, great. So thank you so much. And uh, uh, I am just a moderator and I am just, uh, there is a, a, a old Chinese saying says, I'm throwing the stones and I'm attracting the diamonds. So what I will do is just do some very brief introduction of what uh, of my understanding of the NFTs and these, uh, these kind of uh, technologies on the blockchain technologies and what are their kind of um, uh, influence to the intellectual property pro uh, protection and its enforcement. So basically, uh, this is me. Uh, I will be very quickly, I am a partner here in China and Hong Kong, and I have been practicing law for 20 years, and uh, that's all. <laughs> so if you guys wish to con contact me, just to scan this kind of a QR code and you can find me. So that's not a, the, the point. So the next slides would be the meat. Uh, I will give a very brief kind of introduction of what are the NFTs and what are their nature, uh, the legal nature of the NFTs. Basically, uh, everyone knows that NFTs are built on the so-called blockchain technology. And this kind of a technology make all the so-called records or the evidence can be uh, uh, you know, blocked on all these kind of uh, 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 servers, and they have these kind of uh, characteristics like the immutability, decentralized, and security. So that's, that's what we read everywhere, and we heard about it. However, I want to translate this kind of a technological uh, kind of uh, uh, languages to the human language, which is basically there are two kinds of blockchain uh, technologies. One is the, the so-called uh, fungible token, which is uh, you can uh, just like a concert ticket that is not specifying the seat, your seat. You can enter a concert and you can uh, stand everywhere and you don't recognize yourself to the others. And this is the so-called fungible token. Another kind of a token online is the NFT, which is uh, basically the non-fungible token, which is like the concert tickets, which are specifying the seat and your name sometimes, and maybe your privileges, like you, are, you, you, you have your privilege of not only listening to the concert, but also singing in the concert, or you don't have this kind of privilege, you can just sit it, but everything has been uh, defined and each 
kind of this kind of a token or this kind of a ticket cannot be you know uh, uh, cannot be changed and each ticket is different so that's the so-called non-fungible token and there is a another very important uh concept in the nft world which is metadata so the first issue is to clarify what exactly are the nfts metadata and what exactly the buyers of an nft product will receive what do you receive in most cases in my understanding metadata of an nft do not contain actual artworks metadata only records the say some very basic kind of information like author title uh date of the creation of the art and the so-called owner of this ticket this token and the uri which is like url is a kind of an address of the artwork so it is linked to the uh, a copy of the art artwork not the artwork itself or the copy of the artwork itself no it's just a link there won't be a copy of the artwork on the blockchain. Therefore, for NFT bearing the artworks, what a buyer will actually receive is indeed, in legal terms, in my understanding, is a transferable, transferable license. Once you purchase the NFT, you receive a license from the token creator. From the legal perspective, this means that the token creator must receive the license from the original copyright owner or whatever kind of IP right owner. In this regard, different NFT platforms have their different kind of scope of the licenses. I would not give this uh, examples, but basically this is what the nature of this kind of NFT. So speaking human languages again, metadata is similar to the concept of venues, seating information, and the name of the ticket holder printed on the concert ticket. So that's basically the metadata. Then, because the NFT is indeed bearing a license for use of the deposition of the subject matter, so what an NFT represents would be, I would say, uh, in theory, unlimited. You can record any interest, legal interest, into the metadata. Say, for example, trademark, you can create an NFT containing a license of using your brand or your logo on a particular metaverse, say for example, such license can restrict the scope of the use in terms of the goods, as well as the so-called territory of the internet world. Another possibility is the, uh, in the IP world is the new plant varieties. The NFT can label the new varieties namely recording the distinctness and verify the uniformity and the stability of these new plant varieties. If you do the plant patent, you know these three items are the test of the new plant varieties. Furthermore, the NFT can be extended to identify your any kind of interest, uh, even a particular physical object, such as a tree or even a leaf, uh, a tree leaf. So long as you have a way to fix the identification of each tree or leaf, then you can put such identification onto the NFT metadata and see who is interested in buying this kind of tree or leaf. In fact, this is one of my clients. They are actually already selling the NFT representing the tree leaf. Very interesting case. So, from so going back to the the the, the law enforcement issue so um i will not uh, speak too much about this kind of concept because my my colleagues here panelists will will uh, elaborate them but very briefly from the author's per per perspective if if you believe that your work is sold without your authorization uh, through an nft then you will need to consider the following issues the first is whether the NFT creator has been actually licensed to use the work. The second is what are the license terms, say the scope, duration, 
details of the rights being licensed and whether those rights are transferable. These are very traditional IP licensing issue. The third is who should be responsible for the infringement? Say for example, the NFT creator, the platform of selling the, of selling the NFT or even the buyer of the NFT. From the buyer's perspective, we should know again, where is the binding text, legal text of the licensing terms? What are the indemnity and the guarantee terms? This is to prevent that the NFT creator failed to justify themselves to be authorized the user of the NFT contracts. Uh, if a buyer is sued by original author, then she needs to know where can she find the NFT creators. Finally, from the creator's perspective, uh, the creators need to know determine what the license terms uh, are going to be granted by the authority uh, by by the authors. This is because that the IP rights are still physically territorial, and the enforcement could be hard if the contract is uh, if the contract chooses a non-feasible governing law. So uh, for the creators, they need to basically, before they create their standard agreement or the metadata, they need to define which law they are looking for. So going to the further steps of enforcing the IP rights would be, of course, the evidence productions. Uh, assuming you uh, create an app, artwork and find that the artwork is used or sold through the NFT platform. You need to prove that it is you instead of the NFT generator to be the copyright owner or IP owner. This goes back to the tradition evidence production topics. The, 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 the other issue is the jurisdiction issue. IP rights are subject to the jurisdic jurisdictions. When a blockchain is deployed across sovereignty borders, then you need to figure out which country you are sued and how you can enforce the judgments. So this is, again, the jurisdiction issues. However, because we have discovered, uh, we have just mentioned that the artworks or other IP subjects are not actually reproduced on the blockchain but stored at a certain address somewhere else, we can find an easier way to identify the jurisdiction because usually the infringement is looking at where the infringing reproduction of the work is located. The final issue would be the platform's liability. Assuming that a platform enables NFT generators to generate and sell NFTs, and one of such NFTs is found, is, is found to be infringing, then whether the platform would be found liable too, which is possible so long as the platform is found to be uh, fa facilitating the infringement uh, with so-called awareness. Uh, meanwhile, the safe harbor exceptions, as everyone, every IP lawyer would know, uh, could apply to this kind of situation too. So if the platform proves that it has taken actions after receiving a takedown notice, for example, then the, the platform can be, uh, can be waived from the, 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 the liabilities. So actually recently in China, a court has found an NFT platform is contributorily liable to the infringement of a copyright in a network, uh, the court has applied the rules set out in finding the, in US, it should be called the vicarious liability. The platform received monetary benefit by charging surcharge for the NFT transactions. So it, it, it was fine this kind of uh, vicarious liability and failed to take sufficient kind of notice to the obvious in, infringement of the copyright. And my colleague uh, Begum will mention this case also, I believe. So uh, the more complex complexities are, 
are the issues to each kind of specific IP rights, and the panelists will deliver their insights about that. But just very briefly, I would say for copyright, there are evidence issue, originality issue, and the scope of license issue. For trademark and brand, uh, when the brand owner finds that it's trademark referred to, uh, say for example, re uh, a trademark is linked to NFT's metadata, then the brand owner may want to take actions. However, the infringement may only be found when the NFT can cause consumer confusion. Therefore, unless a mark is quite well known, the brand owner may not be able to take actions against this kind of unauthorized use of their brand, uh, especially in those kind of goods and services that the brand is not in use or not registered. So another issue is who is the infringer for trademarks? NFT creators may not necessarily be using a mark. They are not using mark. The buyers may use it. The buyer of the NFT may not be using the trademark in an infringing manner. They are using a, a logo, but in, not in a confusion way or in, in the, on, on those kind of goods and services. So the brand owner would have to spend more resources to monitor, to monitor those kind of uh, 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 use of the, their brand and say whether they have a course of action. Uh, lastly, some issues about the design patent. I think the most uh, complex issue for the design patent is if the NFT does not link to a particular category of the goods, so that the design patent is registered for that goods, then it would be some burdensome for, for the enforcement. The enforcement could be hard. Uh, the last topic I would just to very briefly mention is the regulatory issues, uh, i.e. the government attitude on the NFT. This kind of attitude could, uh, could be heavily impact the validity of the tr NFT transactions. For example, in China, NFT contract, I mean mainland China, not Hong Kong, NFT contract shall not promise any refund, shall not promise any interest and in buyback terms. Or if this kind of thing has been promised, this kind of issuance of the NFT would be found regulatory illegal. It's a kind of illegal fundraising. Also, the NFT product cannot be split into shells and having their shells to be traded. This may be found in China, the illegal security insurance. So these kind of restrictions will, will heavily affect the use of the NFT um, because everyone buy NFT, not just for their uh, personal kind of entertainment. They, they want to raise money and kind of investment on it. Another challenge would be the subject matter. In theory, NFT can represent any object, as I have just mentioned. However, if the object is not clearly admitted by law to be protectable, then when a buyer uh, wishes to claim its right, then the claim may be rejected. So our panelist Gosha will cover some of these kind of issues, either on the NFT and the traditional fungible tokens like Bitcoins, uh, like uh, kind of this kind of virtual uh, currencies. So this is my very brief introduction and my understanding on the legal nature of the NFTs. I hope that this kind of clarification will pave a way of, uh, for all of us to find the diamonds from the panelists. So let's move to the next panelist, who is um, Bigum Itach. I believe this kind of pronunciation should be right. Uh, she is the legal manager of uh, Sabanji Holding from Turkey.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. So I am sharing my screen. Do you see my screen? Sorry, I made a mistake. Is it I okay? Do you um, see my um, presentation? Like yes, we see it. Very clear. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tony, for your uh, brief explanation about all our, uh, our subjects. And in this case, uh, you, you could give us, um, you could introduce us uh, in advance. Uh, so, uh, as Donny told, um, I am legal manager of Sabanjo Holding, um, and uh, this is a, actually a conglomerate uh, of Turkey, uh, Turkey's leading conglomerates, and we are operating in uh, 14 countries in Europe, Middle East, Asia, North Africa, and uh, North and South America. Uh, so, and we are also uh, performing in technology sectors, uh, in insurance and in um, various sector actually. Um, today's topic is very new actually, even though it has been eight years that uh, NFT uh, is, on the, um, is on the stage, uh, but still uh, we need to actually uh, seek um, answers to many questions and there are still um, every day, uh, each day uh, we are facing some problems regarding NFTs and these problems uh, are subject um and are uh, subject to the um, uh, to the legal issues actually and these legal issues is in um, in front of the courts and also as well um, between the parties uh, there are some settlements so sometimes we are not aware uh, how the parties uh, are solving or how um, we are not also aware um, the main and final decision of the course because this is very new issue so uh, today uh, i'm hoping to um, brainstorm all together because uh, there is not a specific answer uh, even though we are trying to um, elaborate in terms of uh, under the re relevant and current uh, regulations uh, even though these uh, regulations, uh, they are not uh, clear enough, still not clear enough uh, all around the world. So uh, we can start to uh, seek answers to, for example, NFTs, are they regulated? What is NFT and how do they work? Uh, NFTs are, um, is the legal what is the legal status of an of NFT? And uh, the issues can be arisen uh, from tax law, uh, from the IP law, and so on. Um, so as, as I told, NFTs uh, haven't been explicitly regulated in USA, EU, UK, uh, in, and in Turkey. Uh, so uh, without these kind of regulations, we are trying to uh, find a way, sort it out. And as being uh, lawyers, uh, we are um, trying to uh, raise this, this issue in front of the courts. Uh, I can just uh, give some uh, brief cases, uh, just to give give you um, uh, an idea. Actually, even though my my main topic is uh, copyright, so I will just uh, give you an overview uh, regarding the regulations, current regulations, and current draft uh, regulations as well, and some um, hot um, cases. And uh, maybe these cases will be. Uh, also subject to an appeal. Maybe these are not the final uh, decisions, but still, uh, just to give an idea, uh, I want to um, just to uh, give you some example. For example, the first NFT case uh, um, happened in uh, United Kingdom. Uh, this is uh, Lavinia Deborah Osborne versus uh, Persons Unknown and Ozone Network Inc. Uh, as you, you may uh, understand, uh, persons unknown uh, because of the anonymous um, features of the uh, digital wallets. So you can uh, just be, um, uh, you, you, you can just um, lose your uh, NFT, but you cannot know uh, who, who is a thief. So uh, you, you can just um, go to the courts and uh, apply for uh, against an unknown person. Uh, because this unknown person uh, can just be um, released and revealed um, 
if it's possible uh, by this uh, NFT platforms. So Ozone Network Inc. is an NFT platform. And um, this is a, this is a very um, important um, things that uh, the status of NFT. So uh, first of all, uh, before suing, uh, before open a, open a lawsuit, uh, you must really know uh, what is the status of the NFT, even though your NFT is lost uh, or hacked, uh, your, your wallet is hacked, so you lose your NFT. So what is the status of the NFT? So in UK, uh, the court um, uh, um, give, gives us uh, give, uh, gives us um, an idea that uh, NFT can be considered as a property. Uh, the thanks to this um, approach, actually, Lavinia Deborah can approach to the um, to this platform and freeze uh, freeze the process just to be able to protect um, its uh, her NFT. Uh, and in China, of course, uh, Donny. Um, can maybe later on uh, give more details about um, uh, this famous case. Uh, but in, in China, actually, um, uh, Kiss versus Big Verse, uh, the, the decision of the court uh, is, the, is restricting um, and giving liabilities to the platforms. So the platforms uh, now they have some responsibility uh, to fulfill, even though there is no no specific regulation as far as I understand. And maybe uh, later on, Donny can uh, elaborate it. And in USA, um, as in uh, crypto assets, uh, and is, uh, and uh, as uh, the status of the digital assets, uh, USA also uh, actually con may consider NFTs. Um, uh, as securities, uh, so um, under uh, SEC regulation, um, each case uh, must be uh, elaborated and assessed uh, whether NFT can be considered as security or not. Uh, otherwise, uh, this can uh, fall uh, under this um, uh, SEC regulation uh, and um, the platform can be uh, closed and uh, even you cannot um, be able to use your NFTs. Uh, and in Turkey, finally, uh, we have um, the first case, uh, first talk case, a well-known case uh, about um, um, a, 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 a rock, a rock singer, what um, Cem Karaca is dead, but is this, he is uh, our famous uh, rock singer. So it's about uh, his uh, case uh, because his um, portrait is uh, used as an NFT and um, the, um, uh, the this NFT should be of course uh, removed because this um, person who created uh, generated this NFT in uh, in this blockchain system uh, wasn't um, the authorized person. So the court just uh, gave the gave a decision a preliminary in injunctions uh, so that uh, NFTs could be freezed and uh, it is uh, protected. Um, by the uh, by the court under the court decision so we don't know uh, yet the final decision of the court uh, because this is in front of the ip uh, ip courts now so we will see the developments uh, in the later uh, days um, and in the ua what is going on in the in ua, EUA um, eu sorry um, there is a big regulation called uh, mika uh, the markets in crypto assets. So this regulation uh, will be uh, will be on stage February next year. Uh, so one of the first attempts globally and comprehensive regulation of cryptocurrency markets. So this is why this is a very important regulation. Uh, so like a GDPR, you know, it's a GDPR regulation was also uh, was the first attempt globally and comprehensive regulation. It was uh, it, it is applicable now for all uh, EU uh, states and directly. So this regulation, as it is a regulation, it will be also directly applicable for the EU uh, countries. Uh, so this regulation actually um, has a regulatory from framework for crypto assets uh, issuers and crypto asset service providers, as well as certain types of crypto, crypto assets. Uh, as NFT also is considered as crypto assets, uh, normally uh, the NFTs also are subject to this regulation, but there are some exceptions uh, in the in the regulation, and these exceptions are also uh, criticizing now. 
uh, I, I don't know if the regulation can be uh, modified until it's um, entered in force because uh, it's already approved uh, by European Council. Uh, but we will see the um, uh, upcoming days, we will see how this uh, criticism uh, and um, uh, opinion um, will be meet and find a way uh, how this regulation will, applicable, will be applicable uh, to this NFT. And if the, these exceptions uh, can also be acceptable, we will see in the, in the future, in a very uh, short future. And also uh, in the European Union, uh, also case by case, this, uh, the status of these NFTs uh, are also um, as assessed are, are on, the, on the subject. And uh, generally, national financial uh, supervisory authority, uh, authorities of the, of the countries, they assess the status of the uh, NFT. Uh, as in Turkey, actually, in Turkey also, um, our financial authorities, uh, they are uh, considering the status of the NFT. Uh, actually, Donny already talked about the um, uh, talk about the uh, meaning and definition of the of the NFT. But uh, I will just give you also another uh, kind of details, uh, and maybe uh, you can also uh, understand um, more and more uh, better with this um, image. This is a metadata, and you see the contract address token. Uh, and contract address and token are the main uh, combination, main elements of this token. So without this um, contract address and token, an NFT a token cannot be uh, generated in the system. Uh, what is token ID? Uh, this is generated upon the creation of the token. So you have a unique ID. That's why uh, non-fungible token NFTs are unique. Uh, you have also a unique contract address a blockchain address that can be viewed everywhere in the world because uh, you know the system blockchain this is a decentralized and distributed uh, system so you can see uh, in everywhere in the world this uh, address uh, is generated in your system uh, and also you have uh, another items in your uh, in your system in these combinations the wallet address of the creator and links as Donny told, uh, NFT is, um, has just uh, some uh, codes and uh, it's not the work itself, but this is a digital, digital signature that is linked in some, some way to an original work. Uh, so this is a very important um, detail to, uh, to keep in mind uh, because each time you assess uh, the status of NFT or the license um, license and the ownership of the copyrights uh, you need to think about uh, who um, what what is uh, what is license and um, what is the what is the role of the nft uh, on the hand uh, so there are some regulations who, uh, which uh, also define uh, crypto asset and nft uh, but still uh, not um, clear and um, these these definitions also um, are criticizing um, because maybe in the later on nfts cannot be mustn't be limited uh, on blockchain and then we will find this nft on the other uh, systems so that's why um, these kind of definitions um, are not uh, really good uh, they are not really very well accept, uh, accepted but uh, now, uh, in, under our current and um, current regulations, we can just uh, see this definition and use these definitions. Uh, so NFT is one of the crypto assets. We can just um, summarize it. And NFTs um, must be on the blockchain. Uh, if um, a non-fungible token uh, is on the subject, it must be on the blockchain. And this is a, di a digital item. Uh, and uh, authentication of the ownership of these digital items um, uh, is regulated under NFT, we can say. Um, and token actually uh, can represent anything. Uh, this is a, there, is, there are various types of tokens. And um, so tokens can represent anything so that anything can, which can be digitized uh, can be turned into an NFT. And uh, all digital assets uh, 
for example, digital art, collectibles, music, and physical assets as well, because uh, anything uh, which can be digitized uh, can be turned into NFT. So the physical uh, assets also, uh, which can be digitized, uh, can be tokenized uh, with NFT. So you can tokenize a car, your car, uh, your real estate, your, your house, etc. And um, you can uh, talk, tokenize it with NFT system. Uh, I'm happy yeah. to do a reminder because we are running out of time. So yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> yeah, in in a nutshell, I'm just talking about uh, uh, copyright law in Turkey. Actually, it's uh, similar to EU copyrights. Uh, that's why I'm not uh, going to deep uh, deep inside. So uh, there are financial rights, there are moral rights, and there are formalities. The formalities uh, are very important because uh, NFT. Uh, under NFT system, these formalities cannot be really fulfilled. Uh, so, um, if you, if uh, you see that your um, you can get the ownership uh, of the copyright of an artwork, if it's written like that, uh, it's not uh, true. It's it cannot be transferred directly uh, under this system. So, you need to uh, get another uh, written papers uh, if the really creator want to uh, transfer its uh, ownership, its copyright ownership to you. So you need to uh, have more uh, paper or more um, formalities to, to finalize your uh, NFTs. Um, as Donny said, actually, NFTs, uh, there are lots of type of NFTs. NFTs can be used as a registration, digital certifica certificate and crypto assets. Uh, the third, the third one, crypto uh, NFT, the, an art world also can be an NFT itself, but it's a very uh, expensive way to put this artwork uh, all in a uh, blockchain system. So it's a very expensive. So and we don't see really the examples of this kind of NFT. And uh, we can just uh, summarize that uh, you need to really. Um, Think about uh, does the purchaser of a digital artwork authenticated by an NFT acquire by default ownership of the copyright vesting in that minted artwork? What the smart contract says it's very uh, important. Uh, the usually usual usual confusion um, is that uh, some buyers think that uh, they acquire the underlying work of art and all its uh, accompanying rights. So you need to pay attention. Uh, there are lots of uh, famous uh, cases, uh, board apes, spice dao. You can just uh, search for it uh, because um, there's a big debate about uh, transfer of ownership. And we can uh, just also still uh, think about uh, how how we can do uh, and uh, what, what can be the next steps. Uh, should we really regulate net, uh, NFT platforms like crypto trading platforms? Uh, obliging the marketplace server, service providers to apply KYC rules um, and also create, we should also create awareness on how to read a smart contract, how to determine the types of NFT and uh, IP law service on NFT marketplace also are important for the seller who need to understand if their expectation and the smart contracts con condition meets. Uh, so these uh, kind of uh, items uh, also uh, are important and uh, to be sold. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Bigum. And uh, I would uh, uh, ask for a kind of extension of our session because these uh, topics are very informative. I, I believe uh, the rest of our panelists will give more in kind of insights about their respective kind of uh, topics. So. Um, I wish everyone would enjoy the rest. So the next speaker would be um, Mr. Barrett Spraggins, and he is the founding partner of Kennedy Lerner Spraggins LLP uh, from the US. Hi everyone, thanks Donnie. Uh, can you see my screen? The presentation? That's it. Okay. Okay. There we go. 
Okay. Wait, All right. Let's see. Okay. Yeah. So let's get to next one here. Um, yeah. Thank you, uh, Begum. That was a fascinating uh, overview of uh, NFT regulations and copyrights. Um, and thank you, Donnie, for the introduction to NFTs. That was a really good technical explanation and hopefully everyone was able to, to follow along. Um, my name is Barrett Spragans. I am a U.S. patent attorney and partner in the IP boutique Kennedy Leonard Spragans based in Austin, Texas. Uh, for the last 15 years, I've helped clients build, manage, and sell their IP portfolios. I've worked with organizations of all sizes, from startups to universities to large multinationals. I have a background in electrical engineering, so I've worked in a wide range of uh, inter uh, industries and technologies. Recently, clients uh, in the last year or so have been interested in creating uh, digital products um, and offering new um, virtual services and goods such as NFTs or um, entering in some form the metaverse. So I've helped them understand those issues and adapt their IP strategy for entering the metaverse and creating these goods and services. Um, so I'd like to share those strategies with you today, um, particularly as they relate to trademarks. So to federally register a trademark in the United States, in addition to a bunch of other requirements, you, the mark needs to be distinctive and used in U.S. commerce for each classification of good or service listed in your application. Uh, protection is generally limited to the classification of goods or services that are listed in your application. And this system of distinct classifications is what allows multiple companies to effectively have the same mark. Um, so, for instance, um, Apple Computing Company and Apple Cleaning LLC both own the Apple trademark. Um, so if you're offering a new good or service, um, in addition to your existing line of product or services, you need to determine whether your existing trademarks, um, whether they have classifications that cover your new product line or new offering. And the same would apply if you're creating a virtual good or service. Um, often your virtual good or service is very different than your um, than some of your other product lines. And you see this with uh, clothing apparel companies that have created NFTs and have entered the metaverse. So Nike is a good example. They make tennis shoes and now they have recently started creating NFTs of their tennis shoes. So um, it's a digital representation of a physical good. Well, that is a, sorry, I skipped that. <laughs> um, that is a really a completely different type of product. And so they have adopted uh, adapted their strategy to cover these metaverse or virtual goods and services. So for instance, class nine, downloadable virtual goods, class 35, retail store services featuring virtual goods, class 41, online entertainment services, namely providing online non-downloadable virtual goods. So their new trademarks cover all of these classes and those are designed to protect their NFT products, their metaverse offerings. Um, so if you don't file trademark protection, you don't cover your virtual goods or services, then you're taking the risk that a third party will use your trademark to sell their own virtual goods or services in the metaverse um, or as NFTs. And that will lead you to starting to think about trademark infringement. Um, so in general, um, the same laws that apply for protecting real world content also apply to digital content. According to the U.S. legal framework and existing case law, uh, use of trademark content is balanced between trademark protections and the right to free expression. Um, the Second Circuit 
um, articulated a test in the case uh, Rogers v. Grimaldi, a two-factor test uh, for finding if um, there's trademark infringement. And they're looking at whether there's artistic relevance to the underlying work and whether it's misleading as to the source of the work. So I want to discuss a few cases that identified um, that apply the Rogers test. The first is Hermes. They make Hermes v. Rothschild. They or Hermes makes the Birkin bag. And so if you don't know, it's a very popular, uh, very expensive handbag, uh, very distinctive. And they also, of course, own the trademarks related to that brand and that type of product. Rothschild, Rothschild created an NFT collection called Meta Birkins that featured basically the Hermes bag um, in different forms. So different types of colors and combinations, but it was basically a Birkin bag. So Hermes sued him for trademark infringement. The court applied the Rogers test and the court found that there was no artistic relevance. So Rothschild's use had no artistic relevance um, to the underlying work. And what they, what the court meant by that was that there was no, um, there wasn't a non-commercial association between the trademark use and the actual trademark. Um, in fact, Rothschild's comments that he made in promoting the NFT collection and, um, and in selling it all indicated that he wanted to use and capitalize the goodwill of the Hermes name and the Birkin bag to help sell his NFT collection. So um, the court found that there was just no artistic, there was no artistic relevance. There was no reason for him to use it as part of an artistic expression. It was purely commercial. Court also looked at whether um, his use was misleading, mainly, you know, would a person think that Hermes would have some sort of connection to this? And the court found that there was enough evidence to suggest that, yes, someone would be confused by this and someone would think that Hermes was connected to this um, NFT collection. Now, this case is very early. Um, all this information came out um, in response to Rothschild's motion to dismiss. Court um, found that there was enough on both counts of the Rogers test to proceed ahead. So that'll be an interesting case to watch. Um, the next two cases are actually video game cases. Um, and, you know, NFTs and the metaverse, all of these are really new areas. There's not a lot of case law, but this type of digitalization and use of um, real world content in a digital form is something that we've seen before in video games. So video games can provide a nice um, I think indicator of how a lot of these issues are going to be decided. So the first case is ESS versus Rockstar Video Games. So Rockstar Video Games created the NFT, or I'm sorry, created the uh, video game uh, Grand Theft Auto series. And Grand Theft Auto series basically takes a um, creates a virtual city that's based on an American city, but represents it in a very seedy way. So they kind of take the worst elements of the city and um, portray it in the game. And the game at issue here was um, uh, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. And it was based on, a lot of it was based on East LA. So to capture and create the businesses they wanted to put in their virtual city, they flew their artists from Scotland to LA, had them take pictures of businesses in the um, East LA area and then use that to model and create the virtual businesses in their um, game. And one of those virtual businesses that they created was um, a strip club called the Pigpen. And it um, ESS uh, create, has a, a real business in East LA called the uh, Playpen. So they sued them for trademark infringement, um, court applied the Rogers test, and they found artistic relevance in this case. And namely, the court found that Rockstar Games wasn't trying to copy any one business. It was trying to capture the look and feel of a seedy East LA business. So it makes sense they would use elements of um, 
the real world and trademarked material to create that look and feel. And there was an artistic reason for that. So there was artistic relevance. They also went ahead and looked at whether it was misleading and they found that, um, I know we're getting close for time. They found that Rockstar Games makes strip clubs, doesn't make strip clubs and ESS doesn't make video games. So there was no likely to be con likelihood of confusion. Um, last case, I'll just go through really quickly. AM General um, versus Activision. AM General makes the Humvee. Activision has the Call of Duty video game. Um, Activision included the Humvee trademark in their video game. Um, they had their military guys going around in Humvee vehicles. Court applied the Rogers test and found that that use was artistically relevant, that you would expect um, military guys in a video game to be in Humvees because that's what they do in the real world. So again, that there was this um, artistic relevance. They also looked at whether it was going to be misleading and they found for the same reason in Rockstar, um, AM General makes uh, vehicles, Activision makes video games. It's not really misleading who's making what. Um, trademark consideration conclusions. If you're creating um, new virtual good and service, make sure your trademarks cover those classifications. And if you are an artist or a company and you want to use other people's trademark material, the bar is pretty low. You just need to have that artistic relevance. All right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Barrett. And I, I thank you so much for your patience. And I uh, have uh, applied secretly uh, to the organizer. So we do have time. So, Gosha, please, uh, you do have time. Thank you. I am glad. I appreciate that. Um, so this is the fourth part of our presentation. My name is Gosha, and I would like to thank the organizers of the Gorilla Conference for letting me speak at this panel. And um, let me start um, by saying that I am a partner at Hickman Becker Bingham La Desma. It is a boutique IP law firm in San Jose, California. On this slide, you have my contact information, my email address and my uh, profile uh, hyperlink and also QR code with some additional information. My practice focuses on client counseling and patent prosecution with special expertise in computer networks. I am a patent attorney. I draft and prosecute patent applications and my specialty is artificial intelligence internet-related technologies, telecommunications, virtual machines, and so forth. You can continue reading that <coughs> from my profile if you wish. Um, my presentation outline um, was going to be quite robust. I was going to, and I am going to talk about Coinbase collapse, Robinhood fraud, Tesla impairment charges, titanium fraud and uh, difficulties that the Bank of um, New York Mellon uh, is encountering these days. And um, I was going also to mention about things that happened just recently. Um, probably you've been aware, you, you are aware of the FTX and the uh, by finance situation. Yesterday, by finance decided that they are putting the merger and acquisition of FTX on hold. <coughs> and uh, they wanted to perform more diligence tests. Um, now, the, today's article actually explains that um, the difficulties with FTX was because um, FTX actually lends their customers money to Alameda Research and so forth. Um, I would like to encourage uh, the audience to read those articles from all kinds of news feeds because this is something very um, current. These, these problems with cryptos are, are uh, happening right now. And the message I would like to convey is that there is so much fraud going on in relationship to the cryptocurrency transactions and NFTs in general. And um, just as uh, my colleagues mentioned, this 
whole market is not fully regulated and there are not that many um, overseeing agencies. The, therefore, um, if you are an investor, if you are really involved in this uh, type of uh, trading or transactions, be careful. There are articles every day that are about crypto crisis. And here I have um, one uh, that I would like to share with the audience. Just two days ago, an individual from San Diego um, who was uh, trained uh, involved in uh, crypto transactions on the Coinbase platform, lost $1 million. Um, so apparently someone compromised his uh, API key, got into his account, and within five hour period, conducted 11,000 trades and brought the account of that particular individual down by $1.2 million. I didn't mean to scare anyone, just please be aware of it. Um, so those were the things that I wanted to mention um, as my introduction, because um, those things happened before I prepared my slides. But now let's move on to the slides and let's start talking about the Coinbase collapse. Um, the CEO of Coinbase platform is Brian Armstrong who was uh, or who is an early devotee of blockchain technology. He had big plans. He hired hundreds of employees, pushed into new markets and scaled up the number of digital tokens. Um, in fact, Coinbase became the largest crypto exchange in America and went public in spring of 2021 with a market value of nearly $86 billion. That's really a significant amount. And that also gives us some idea of how um, the euphoria with the crypto platforms um, was growing at that time. But it didn't last long. Um, in um, very few months later, Coinbase started struggling, just like other crypto companies were, uh, have been struggling. The Bitcoin prices went down by about 50% in 2022. <coughs> and generally, if crypto prices rise, then Coinbase is likely to emerge as a winner. But it doesn't look very promising at this point. On this slide, you have two charts. The chart on the left is showing trading volumes for major US crypto exchanges as a percentage of 2021 peak. So if you look closely at this chart on the left side of my slide, sometime in June of 2021, um, the main crypto uh, trans transactions uh, platforms like Coinbase, Gemini, Binance, they were really flourishing. If we assume those um, trading volumes as 100% at this time, um, about June of 2021, then you can see that by uh, September, October of 2022, they went down to just 25% of what the peak was. And the interesting part is that pretty much all of them converge in this low value. Um, that is not good. And now we know why, right? There is this general collapse of the trading, of the crypto trading platforms um, as well. Another factor that is worth looking at is the employees uh, situation. So this is a chart for the Coinbase full-time employees. And it shows that in the second quarter of 2022, a Coinbase um, decided to lay off about 1,000 1, employees out of their 6,000 force of um, employees. Um, that's not good. Um, but you probably hear that that happens across the whole technology market. Um, I'm sure you watch the news, uh, what uh, Meta is doing, what uh, Twitter is doing, and so forth. But sticking to the subject of the crypto transaction, um, the message we are trying to convey here is, please be careful. The things are not looking well. Um, think twice before investing. 
Now a few words about Robinhood. Robinhood is another uh, crypto uh, transaction platform, and they were fined $30 million by the financial regulator in New York. So um, they were imposed the $30 million fine for alleged violations of anti-money laundering and cybersecurity regulations. So what exactly they did? They apparently failed to maintain and certify compliant anti-money laundering and cybersecurity programs. So for those who are um, um, into a privacy law and who are certified um, to practice that type of um, discipline, you probably realize that SEC and other agencies and other financial regulators are trying to get control of the crypto market. But as uh, my colleagues mentioned today, it's still in its infancy, it's still being developed, but developed but um you know someday these even the platform centered market is going to be regulated more but not now yet tesla uh, no i'm not going to talk about twitter today but i am going to talk about elon musk and what he did for tesla in regard to the bitcoin um or cryptocurrency um Tesla just in this year, 2022, recorded a 170 million impairment charge, that's a, a type of a loss, against the carrying value of its Bitcoin holdings for the first six months of 2022. Now, the second uh, paragraph is, is uh, kind of detailed, but very important. So, um, Mr. Musk said the company sold 936 million dollar worth of Bitcoin in a second quarter to maximize its cash position as it dealt with the closure of its Shanghai factory due to the COVID-19 lockdowns. Um, there is a debate whether that's really a real reason or not, but let's put that aside. The fact is that they did sell $936 million of their Bitcoin. The company unloaded around 75% of its 1.5 billion initial position, leaving them with about 218 million worth. So think about it. If Mr. Musk is dumping crypto, then it doesn't look good for the market in general. Um, kindly keep that in mind. Now, Mr. Musk was a vocal commentator on digital currencies at the beginning. In fact, they briefly accept, accepted Bitcoin as a payment for the Tesla vehicles, but they suspended that policy in May 2021. Why? Because the value of the Bitcoin went down and it went down significantly. So at the moment, Tesla is not selling any Bitcoin and you cannot purchase a Tesla vehicle using the cryptocurrency. That is something also to think about and keep in mind. Titanium, another example of, uh, well, maybe not another, but this is a big example of uh, fraudulent transactions. In fact, uh, Titanium Blockchain Infrastructure Services um, had a CEO who pleaded guilty for his role in the cryptocurrency fraud scheme that involved raising about $21 million in an initial coin offering. Uh, the CEO, Michael Allen Stollery, uh, a resident of Reseda, California, pleaded guilty to one count of securities fraud in a US district court in Los Angeles. So what's the message here? Um, even inside the platforms, even inside the uh, executive or the management uh, team, there are fraud cases, there are uh, actions that should um, concern us. Now, what exactly Mr. Stoller did? So he lured investors to purchase bars, that's the crypto coin issued by um, Titanium, through false and misleading statements. What exactly were those statements? Well, 
he falsified white papers that explained how the underlying technology for the cryptocurrency works and planted fake testimonials on the company website. Which means we need to be very careful what we read, what documents we sign, and before we enter any transaction, uh, do some research and investigating. Would that help us to avoid situation if we wanted to invest, or invest in uh, titanium and use their blockchain? Hard to say. But this is this is a big case. This is a big fraud case. Um, so please keep that case in mind. Now a few words about oldest bank, Bank of New York Mellon. They announced in October of 2022 that they will begin receiving clients' cryptocurrencies, and they will become therefore the first large U.S. bank to safeguard digital assets along traditional investments on the same platform. The key issue here is how secure those transactions are going to be. Um, they said that they will store the keys required to access and transfer those assets and provide the same bookkeeping services on those digital currencies that are also offered to fund managers for their portfolio of stocks funds, commodities, and other assets, which tells us that if this, this kind of crypto-based transactions with a bank of um, New York uh, is going to be secured to the degree, or the same degree as the portfolios of stock bonds. And we know that there is no foolproof securities of that. And the example of, of this kind of issue and security issues was um, demonstrated in a case I talked about at the beginning, the San Diego case. Um, so um, please be careful. In fact, please, please be afraid. You probably heard about uh, situations that even a large grocery chain Safeway is going to accept cryptocurrencies. Also, uh, some uh, charge cards like Visa are going to, or already are, accepting the cryptocurrencies. So um, be aware of those different situations, of the fraud, the fraudulent actions. And just this year, there was a dramatic self of um, digital currency and wiped out about $2 trillion in value. Um, people are selling it. It's not secure. It's very risky. And the market is very volatile. Um, the downturn also triggered the collapse of several prominent crypto firms, renewing, uh, renewing calls to impose more investor protections on businesses that trade, store, and lend digital assets. Um, I have more information, but um, I think I will end at this point. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. And I will uh, hand it over to others. Thank you. Thank you, Gosha. Uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation and every uh, panelist. Uh, we still have three to four minutes. So um, firstly, I, I, I would uh, respond to Gary's question. I see he asked if, is it possible to store artwork on the blockchain? Uh, Barrett, would you mind to, to answer this question very quickly? There we go. Uh, yeah, that's, I mean, that's a good question. Um, typically with NFTs, you um, are pointing to a URL location where the artwork can be accessed and viewed. You're not actually storing the artwork itself on the blockchain. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree with you. It's very uh, kind of, a, from my perspective, I would say it's because because of the encryption, uh, uh, encryption uh, needs a lot of resources. So it's hard. Theory, theoretically, there is a chance, but actually you don't have this kind of uh, opportunities. Mm -hmm. So uh, is I, I would like to cool. add something, Donny, here. Um, you know, yeah, sure. storing on a blockchain, uh, the idea is in general great. I mean, it provides a very high level security, but at the same time, 
the hackers become so so sophisticated that I wouldn't be surprised that in the near future, even the security of blockchain is going to be questionable. It is, a, I mean, think about the different ways that, um, you know, uh, zero reference, uh, ransom, all kinds of um, tricks that the hackers are using. And I think that the blockchain technology will have to evolve even more and more to improve the security. Maybe it's good right now, but it may not be um, in the near future. And that is concern as well. Right, right. That's also a very kind of a, re a very good a kind of a reminder. No technology is actually secure because sometimes not because of the technology itself, but also because of the way and the measure you protect your say for example, say for example your passcode, all these kind of things. So um, because we are running out of time, one last thing I would ask each of you of the panelists, being IP professionals very quickly what's your one sentence advice to the ip owners before they jump into the crypto world uh, uh, uh how about uh, gosha from you but one sentence i think that before you get involved with cryptocurrencies with trading the transactions the platforms and putting your own money in line you should educate yourself um, and there is it is impossible to avoid all the pitfalls and all the difficulties but at least walk into it with um, some level of experience or some level of knowledge uh, because i think especially my presentation should made should have made a significant impact on the audience that this is a risky business. It still is, and it will be. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Bigum. Your one sentence suggestion. Okay. Uh, in terms of copyrights uh, and for creators, um, you, you you need to determine uh, your needs and then design your um, contracts. And then uh, for buyers, you need to read carefully terms and conditions and uh, carefully understand and be sure that you really understood the process yeah. and the transaction and what you will uh, get. Thank you. Yeah. Great. That's, that's wonderful. So, Barrett. Well, I would say be prepared to pivot. Um, you know, whatever you think the project's utilization or use is going to be now, it may, the conditions may be different um, months from now, six months from now, whenever you get the product launch and you need to have, you know, some room, I guess, to, to change the project. Okay, great. Thank you so much, everyone. My last sentence is wonderful presentations, wonderful, very informative, and I hope to see everyone soon. And let's move to the next session. I will skip my sentence. Thank you so much. Thanks, Donnie, for moderating this session. Thank Osia. Thank Bigum. And thanks, Barrett. Thanks for sharing your thoughts on uh, the topic. And uh, could I request to close the screen share? So the, yeah, great. So I just request the speakers to look at the camera and smile for a second so that we can capture this moment. All right, thank you so much. Now we'll, we'll uh, head on to our final session. And once again, if anyone will have any question for our speakers, you can write it to us or we can simply share their contact details and you can mail it to them as well. Thank you once again. Thank, Thank you very you. much for your patience. Bye-bye.